all of you. Good evening. Wow. This room looks like somebody's having a wedding. It's beautiful, really, really stunning. But it's really great to see all of you back in this room after an amazing opening this morning and a series of really, really impactful and insightful discussions. But I think what we're about to have now crowns it all. The powerful panel that we have this evening is really a powerful way to end the wonderful day and the really exciting day that we have had. So ladies and gentlemen, this evening, it's about seizing the moment. Seizing the moment to dialogue with our panel and share some introspection on the changing face of leadership in Africa. The current emerging trend of political transparency, ladies and gentlemen, with free and fair elections on our continent is super encouraging. I am excited about it. You've seen the trend this year. Yeah, I'm happy. You'll agree with me that most of the political transitions we have seen in the last year have, in fact, renewed hope in all of us and have signaled to the rest of the world that Africa can also do it. With our panelists this evening, we will discuss critical key actions that we can all employ to sustain the current political trend that we're all witnessing and to leverage this momentum for economic development as well on our continent. Ladies and gentlemen, the group of panelists do not need any introductions. We hear of them every day. We see their work. We know them so well. But please, join me to welcome my panelists. I'll just mention their names, but we know them. By starting with Mrs. Gracia Michelle. And Freedom fighters, 
who were there, we were just talking with uh, Madame just now. Um, in terms of the context, we had uh, people who had uh, a will uh, to do something, to free the country, to make things happen in the concert. Of course, we had a living legend who just left us five years ago. He was there for a cause. And we have seen uh, the continent being convulsed quite a bit after this. And what we have seen recently has been an emergence of new leaders. Mm -hmm. uh, new leaders who are now moving away from the army space. We are seeing new leaders who are now professionals. Um, you know, all sorts, a uh, mix of people. And I think this new leadership of the new uh, kind of uh, train uh, leaders that we have, these are the people who are who we can count on to change the narrative in the continent. And we are witnessing this, and uh, we had a long day today discussing all this, and I think this is what is resonating uh, across, is that we need that kind of, of uh, enlightened leadership mm -hmm. to do things differently. And I was saying, I was speaking to Madame Michelle just now, is that there is still space on this continent to transform, to have transformative leadership, exactly as we had 50 years ago, because there's still plenty of space in which we can still make a difference. And I think some of the leaders are gearing up to this. And here, if I may cite a few names, uh, I look at a, a country, I'll just be very, very honest about it. If you look at what Rwanda had been through, mm. and if you look at what Rwanda is now, I mean, people can say many things, but I think I admire the leadership that President Kagame has brought to, the, to, to his country. For, for, for now. So, and I'm sure there'll be many more coming through who will actually bring the change that we need and that we actually deserve. Fantastic, fantastic. Hamid, your, your banking platform is across many African countries, so you've seen, I know you're in the private sector, but you've seen some of the transformations that we're seeing now. What is your take on it from where you sit as a private sector leader? Well, I think it's important that um, People understand that the only way the private sector can thrive is when there's good leadership again in the public sector. I agree with you. They must work hand in hand. I agree. Now we are seeing all of those transitions happening in most of the countries that we have been present in, mm -hmm. uh, whether it is Rwanda, just as I mentioned, mm -hmm. or it is places like Sierra Leone mm -hmm. and several post-conflict regions. But they are going through much more interesting transformations ten years after. Absolutely. Okay. Now, so we are also beginning to see it in the businesses. So the businesses are picking up and all of that. It is important, all right, that people understand that the only way the private sector can exist, all right, is having a strong public sector uh, presence. And that strong public sector presence only comes from a strong democratic foundation. And that is, that, that's extremely important. Amazing. Yes. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you for that. Mrs. Okay. Michelle, a real force to be reckoned with. That's what I, that's how I see you. Listening to, to Herbert speak, um, we can clearly see how the strength in health system goes beyond the public sector and how the private sector um, also gets involved. You have done outstanding work as a philanthropist and, and have had several accolades in transformation work uh, as well. So as a philanthropist, how do you think non-elected leaders such as yourselves on this panel, the philanthropists around the room, can positively influence political systems in Africa? Let me begin by suggesting that uh, any nation should, in my view, have uh, something like a, a national compact. Mm -hmm. Clarity on, as a nation, what are the targets and goals we have to achieve together in a certain period of time. And uh, political leadership, business leadership, academic leadership, social organizations of different kinds, including philanthropists, to be clear that we are all part of a nation and we have a national agreement on where we have to go sure. and how to, to reach certain goals. And that, that space, we agree, but we take responsibility according to the sector in which we operate and also we account. Mm -hmm. So many times we, we expect us to make governments accountable, but it, shouldn't we also be accountable exactly. in, in the same space? I mean, exactly. business should account to that space. Uh, philanthropists should also account to that space. Academics 
to see that we are all working together for a common goal. But your question is, how do you keep government uh, accountable? Mm -hmm. I think one is, if the goals are clear, then you engage in an exercise of give and take. Because if we go on to ask them and why you are not doing this and that, the relationship can be very tense. Yeah. You say, we as a philanthropist, we offer this. This is what we have been doing, whether it's in health, in education, in different kind of things we are doing. We offer this, but we see the government, for instance, lacking whether it's legislation, whether it's regulations, what many times is called the environment, the conducive environment. So you indicate where the government has to perfection its responsibilities. In a way you say also, I recognize I have responsibilities and this is how I'm performing. So you create a relationship of give and take. That's what I would think it's, it's the healthy way of accountability. Yeah. Fantastic, fantastic. Very well said. And I'm just wondering, Kevin, I'm coming back to you again, yes. um, because all of, in all of this, um, we believe that the private sector has a role. But most of the time, we sit back, private sector, we sit back quite a bit. So coming back to you, um, because you also have a platform, you're in so many different countries, so you see a lot. Yes. What is your take on that? How, how do we create this balance, building on what Mrs. Michelle has just um, shared with us? We are all jointly responsible for the development of the societies in which we exist. Um, and until we all appreciate that, we cannot hold just the public sector responsible and we will not make progress. That's the first thing. Yes. Secondly, we must also realize that the era of just waiting for foreign donors uh, to come in to support the continent is long gone. Can we give a right. round of applause? <laughs> We have to do it ourselves. Um, if they come, fine. Otherwise, nobody owes the continent anything but ourselves. Exactly. Okay? Now, um, several years ago, my former chairman, the city here, um, we started a big crusade, for instance, at the time when uh, we were having donor fatigue with respect to AIDS. And we carried that flag and we said we wanted to go across the continent, getting the private sector to support this whole fight against HIV AIDS. Mm -hmm. Now, the foreign donors came later, but that was fine. As far as we're concerned, let us come together and work. So it's all about working, working together. Now, several things need to be done, and I'll bring it down to my own sector. One of the things we found out is that uh, international institutions are technically disintermediating Africa. Mm -hmm. Understandably so. I mean, they'll tell you about the growing cost of compliance and all sorts of things um, you know, across the world. Now, what that does is that if we don't stand up to solve our problems, and I'm talking about both private and public sector, all right. all right, you get into that vicious cycle of poverty. You never get better. And then they keep seeing Africa with all the narratives, despotism, hunger, mm -hmm. uh, disease, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the private sector has to stand up. So if you have banks or you have financial, or you're in the financial services sector, you have to write it to become a global enterprise, all right, to support the continent to grow. So that is what is, what is, what is critical. We all have a role to play, whether it's in the philanthropic space, um, it's in the medical space, um, you run your financial services, you are in government, etc. We cannot pass the blame and say, no, it's public sector, they're not doing well. We cannot blame the democratic institutions. After all, we are all a part and parcel Absolutely. of that whole thing. Absolutely. So that's what is important. Absolutely. Yeah. I couldn't have agreed with you more. Fantastic. So I wish we had a room full of CEOs here mm -hmm. to, to hear this <laughs> in many ways. So, Obi. You have also had a very remarkable career and a strong advocate um, for transparency, accountability, a lot of policy work that you, you've done in reforms in Africa. So from your previous roles that you've had, World Bank um, and also private sector, philanthropists, governments, how do, you played a facilitation role, I'm sure, with all, with all these um, um, various sectors or stakeholders. How do you think philanthropists should hold governments accountable for serving in the best interest of their citizens, doing what is best for their citizens first, putting their citizens first before themselves. I think that the first thing is to assert that um, the late motif, as you would say, mm -hmm. you know, the reason that the reason that government exists mm -hmm. is that it should be the coordinated mechanism mm -hmm. for the rest of society. Mm -hmm. Somebody's mm -hmm. got to lead that process. Like so you've got public sector, private sector, mm -hmm. you've got the citizen sector. Uh, but the government, at the end of the day, is the sovereign entity. The nation state has the capacity to be able to set
set the foundation on the basis of which the rest of society gets signals as to what to do. And that being the case, it means that the superordinate responsibility of government must be established. Mm -hmm. Every other sector trying to do anything resembling the basic role of government in providing the ambience on the basis of which society functions is simply complementary. Mm -hmm. So we must not substitute government with private sector or substitute government with a philanthropy sector. That's one. Number two is that for us to be able to clearly understand which sector works better and for what, we need to understand that over time it's been proven that every time government tries to behave like business, it puts the people in trouble. So we don't want governments you know, strain off into business activities. I recently caused an opera in my country by saying, hey, stop the idea of trying to do a national airline. We know that the record globally is terrible. The record in my country is worse. And so if it's already broken and you know that you couldn't fix it, find something better to do with your time as government. <laughs> organizations and the sector, the, the role that they particularly have is that there are gaps, there are certain gaps in society where government may not be able to reach to. There are things that government may not be able to do as well as that communal spirit, that spirit of buying your social license by participating in the process of helping people within the community. When civil society or philanthropies uh, do this, uh, they, they do it as a matter of uh, ensuring that they are participants in the process of solving some of the problems of society. Mm -hmm. Now, if all of this is clearly understood, these role definitions are understood, then what would happen is that for the accountability issue, the public sector, the private sector, as well as uh, the uh, civil society sector, including the philanthropy organizations, would understand that there are certain gaps. For example, there are things that you do well, which when government tries to do it, for example, providing education, some of the non-government actors have learned some things better than the public school system. How do you bring an intersection of that knowledge with the way that the public sector currently functions. Mm -hmm. So knowledge sharing. Um, you could also look at issues of gaps in evidence-based policy. Mm -hmm. Private sector does not just go widely into things. But you know, governments without any strong civil society looking over them can just wake up one morning and decide on a grant project without caring, <laughs> without caring that it is a huge opportunity cost for the poor. So evidence-based research, I loved that panel that discussed research um, earlier today. It was the most fantastic panel here today. And you know, evidence-based policy orientation, you can force the government into a vortex where it normally would not like to get into by showing, without even you know, saying a word, you do some research, pay for some research, and you put it out there. And the minister looks at it and bows the head because it is basically indicting some of the kinds of policy choices that they are making. So investment in a lot of research by the, your, your segment of society to help. Number three is that you can actually show that, that principle of accountability. There is a way that private sector pretends to be more accountable, and it's a lie, it's a pretense. I, I am one of the co-founders of Transparency International, and in our work, we found that the private sector is as rotten. So, okay, you got me here, you're gonna be yeah. here, you can't be talking, can't be talking, right? You know, yeah, yes, you know, so, so you, you we found a level of rottenness 
within private sector. Private sector never wanted to raise the word corruption at dinner tables. It was considered offensive. But we knew that corruption was <coughs> completely distorting incentives in development. Now, by private sector putting itself out there and saying, we actually care for transparency, we care for accountability, we don't want to do business in a monkey kind of way. It raises the standard and the quality of conversation around the issues of accountability. I shall shut up. No. <laughs> But in the implementation process, there are those like government will have kind of a top-down approach. Right. And the business has the, the, the ability of uh, fine-tuning, for instance, management things, which many times government can have a policy, but in management is lacking. Mm -hmm. And the business can bring a contribution on how you transform policy into manageable practices which deliver the results which are required for, for citizens. Philanthropies, for instance, you, 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 we, she already touched the issue of uh, learning. When you have someone who is working on education, mm -hmm. you learn the lessons, you go into detail of what is it which produce not only numbers, but just quality. And in that sense, you bring it to the government to learn, but also you connect with the other civil society organizations that you amplify the lessons in terms of improving the systems. So I think we, that's why I started my, my view in terms of a national kind yeah. of a space in which we agree. So you bring different strengths Philanthropists, for instance, they, they have the time. They are not rushing like government. Government uh, have a five year, five years plan and they have to produce numbers and so quickly. Numbers count. But it, uh, an organization which really invests in education, in health, will take the time which is required. Again, researching, implementing, seeing what, what works, what is not working. You can take five years, you can take 10 years working on the same field. Yeah. Government will change in five years. Somebody will come at you and have a different ideas and change policy, etc. Civil society organizations can give not only stability to how to implement things, but also these lessons can filter even into improving policy when government wants to listen. And I think one of the problems we are facing on the continent is that there's no enough trust amongst, I mean, these different sectors. Yeah. You know, government sometimes is suspicious that these business people, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and then they go to business because they can provide jobs, and so business is to provide jobs, not to explore other capacities which business can bring that to improve. Very, very I mean, the management of uh, of of the country. Civil society organizations, many times they are able to say, oh, you know, this civil society organization, they have an agenda. They have an agenda, well, yes, because they have chosen one sector in which they want to f focus on and to produce results. But if we trust one another, then you can identify the strengths and the ability to produce better results, which again comes back to national policy and they, they, they help them to improve how we move together. So I would insist that we need to, um, to, to find ways of building this trust. Mm -hmm. Let me give an example of a country where I think they seem to be doing relatively well. 
it's Germany. You know, in terms of uh, those who are in business, they, they might be doing small business, etc., etc. But it's within a national plan. They don't, they don't deviate much of that. Even the foundations which we are working with here, Adam Power, they get funding from the government. It is one kind of uh, uh, constituency they are concerned with. Uh, Friedrich Ebert, yes, they get funds from the government and they are working with us in a specific area. But there is a very strong coordination amongst them in terms of what these national plans and what to achieve in a certain period of time. We don't have this with our governments most of the time. Yes. So we need to create that space. Trust, plan together, work differently, but we come back, we assess how well we are doing, what are the lessons we have to learn from one another, how then we improve, but a space of trust and knowing that we all have the interests of the nation, the interests of citizens at heart. Very, very powerful news, very, very powerful news. Very powerful news. Thank you so much. Your Excellency, you know I'm coming to you, right? Mm -hmm. I'm coming to you because you are now looking in from the outside, right? You've been there, um, you were the president of a country from a government standpoint. The, the points and the viewpoints that have been expressed in the last few minutes are very powerful. If we take on what Mrs. Michelle just said around trust between public sector and private sector and all stakeholders, civil society, etc., um, what is your take now going, looking in from the outside? Outside or looking from inside, I have always been a great advocate, and I think this has been the message from across uh, from all the years of the as well. Mm -hmm. Is we need to work on our institutions. Mm -hmm. We need to develop strong institutions, and I think for one leader, I've said in the past, Africa needs strong institutions and not strong men and women. And uh, one country has shown that they can do away with government for at least nine months. Belgium and the country will run without any problem. <laughs> so, okay, it's taking it a bit far, but what I'm trying to say is that when, in, when countries have invested, and I think this is the message which come out uh, from Obi, coming out from, from Madame as well here, that, from, to, yes. from Russia, sorry, um, <laughs> that to, it, to increase this notion of accountability, to look at the issue of national compact, issue of global compact, <laughs> These are all institutions that are promoting certain values. Right. And the certain values is trust, as we have rightly said, but also values of institution building. Right. And I have always said, coming from the academic world, we always look up to the Harvard, we look up to the Cambridge, we look up to the Oxford, we look up to Cape Town, mm -hmm. we look up to Pretoria, because these institutions have, in, have invested and have appointed guardians of these institutions. So these people, the mandate is when they come into the institution and by the time they leave, they have to ensure that the institution has become stronger. And this transcends government. Cambridge has existed for over 600 years. It hasn't moved in IOTA in terms of quality because the guardian have ensured that the institution reputation is preserved. And this is something that we have to build in us this morning Credible data will come from credible institutions, and credible institutions are made with credible people, and this has to be sustained throughout. Up until then, we will still be going to this narrative of discussing whether we should encourage accountability, whether we should be, uh, we have to keep on building our institutions. Can I come in here? Yes. Yes. I'm sorry to. No, 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 please. You know, one of the issues which worries me in this African narrative is. How do we, in this building of institutions, how do we generate knowledge which transforms our own institutions? In this case, I'm talking of the, the high level of learning and research to be credible enough to generate the knowledge which, yes, it can be universal, but it responds directly to the needs of our own people yes, at yes, the stage yes, in yes, which yes, we are. Yes. So we need, why do we have always to go to Harvard? Or why do we always to go to Cambridge to go? We can, I mean, we have had already in the past universities of, of a degree of a high quality. And it's high time African countries and African leaders in this case 
really to invest in those institutions, to generate knowledge and to give rise to our scientists who have to shine and to show that they connect knowledge but with the realities and the realities they also feed into what they have. For instance, I would ask you, how many countries do have a very clear research agenda in which you can say universities are researching because yes, they need to develop knowledge, generally speaking, but really they are responding to specific issues which society needs them to do. Many times we have hundreds and thousands of uh, research papers which are putting dust. They are not being, I mean, useful to solve our problems. Yet, then you will go to SOAS, I'm mean, Chancellor of SOAS in a way, <laughs> yeah, but you will go to other institutions in the North to bring, to look for knowledge which has been developed in the perspective of what those institutions, what they pay for, they choose what they want to research on the continent. But we need to be the ones to be very intentional. Mm -hmm. Like for instance, one of the examples, of positive examples you mentioned, uh, the, the issue of HIV. We did have some universities who really confronted yeah. HIV in a very focused way. But I think, why for instance, we, we, we do not know enough of how to produce food on this country? The food, yes. I mean food for us. And food, and it's not only, I mean, to have uh, millies and um, cassava, etc., but a diversified food. And so that we have not only in quantity, but in quality. So that we confront the issues, for instance, of uh, stunting. Who is studying the problem of how to overcome the tragic situation of having 43% of kids in this continent are stunted? But where do you find a serious, I mean, line of research and feeding into policy, feeding into implementation for us to overcome stunting? So again, this issue of uh, we need to be developing really intentionally our institutions to be responding to the challenges even more, to be forthright and looking forward to what we are in the 21st century. It's not only to deal with the issue of hunger, but how do we catch up in science and technology with the rest of the world? That is not very clear. If you look to, uh, at our universities, most of them, they are not I mean, ahead of time to help to transform society. And I think this is one of the issues we have to discuss because we have brilliant people sitting around this table. And when we say we have to work with our government, this is part of what we have to bring to the table. And there are a lot of philanthropists here who are doing work on higher education, who are investing in education, and, and this is part of our, also our role as philanthropists. Exactly. And, and all the various stakeholders. Very, very powerful point indeed. I told you we were going to come to deal with really powerful discussions. Just two points to quickly run in Russia. Exactly. You're absolutely correct. If we look at the, the HIV uh, problem that was present, of course, in the 1990s, 1980s, 90s in, in Africa. They did a study precisely in rural areas where people were feeding on sorghum, they were feeding on you know, traditional foods, mm -hmm. and they did the same study in town mm -hmm. where people were feeding on fast food. Mm -hmm. And they found that those people who were precisely living in the villages, right in the rural areas, they did not develop food no names mm -hmm. because of the quality of the food they were eating. That's one thing. Second thing, which is also coming out big time now, is when we come to drug testing. When we do clinical trial, it is found that increasingly we need to diversify because the genes, the African genes, respond differently to the treatment. To the treatment. And not just in terms of genetics, we're also looking in terms of gender. Mm -hmm. So men and women don't even react the same way. Now, increasingly, in fact, there was an article recently in the New York Times to show that they need to increase more Afro-Americans in the United States into the clinical trial because the doses differ, because the genes react differently. So these are issues which bring us home again to the fact that this is why I completely concur with what Russia said. 
invest in problems, but also not forgetting that we also need new scale research, which is something that we don't do enough because we are very focused on short-term implementation of our research agenda, but we tend to forget that knowledge generation is 50, 60 years down the line. If Einstein didn't do his work in the 1950s, we wouldn't be having a mobile phone today. So these are things that we have to bear in mind that knowledge generation also comes as part of the investment process of our institutions, which unfortunately is still lacking. And business, actually, are good on business. Everyone who is a, a good CEO has a long plan of how to develop a hit business. Yes. They look yes. at this, they don't plan for five years. They have a plan of 2025, and then they know how to do it. But that kind of vision from government side, it's not. The governments are really worried with the, with the five, 10 years in which it's been power. And that's the discussion I'm trying to bring here. That we are looking at a nation. We are not looking at the administration of a country in a specific country. And the experience of investment and when we use the word investing, we mean investment. It means you are not going to have the result in five years' time, possibly. You look at a long-term perspective. And this is a contribution which private sector can bring, civil society organizations can bring in the discussion with governments. We need to invest and not only to have the quick fix which is going to get you relaxed. <laughs> I, I have done a lot of listening to my co panelists. And, uh, and in the process of listening to them, you know, uh, it sort of helped me to, to gather some talk for sure, uh, on, um, on our topic again, which, which really says the changing face of leadership yes. on our continent. And I do think that it is important for us to to question our leadership recruitment process. Yeah. <laughs> our leadership, you know, one thing that we know is that we're now at a place where at least two thirds of the countries in, in Africa are now democracies, basic definition of democracy. <laughs> and that's progress compared to what happened in the last decade of the 80s and the 90s. So it's progress. But that democracy is at such level of nascency that we need to do something quickly to mature it. And to mature that democracy means that we need to begin to pay attention to who enters our politics. What kind of quality of people are we playing the game of governance with? As in a governance where a football match, are we recruiting the kind of people who would be, um, you know, in the top league? Uh, would they be Man U? Or would they be Arsenal? Or would they be, um, we, 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 we wish it the bottom league. <laughs> We, we have to start thinking of governance and the recruitment of the operators of our democracy. Because if you looked at the, the issue of leadership and the effect that it can have in the quality of governance outcome, whether it is in terms of building institutions or it's in terms of sound policies, whether they be economic, social, whatever policies, or it's in terms of prioritization of investment into the key sectors that matter for lifting the poor out of poverty, you will see that that role of leadership is indispensable. Because it is indispensable, every time you take leadership and give it to a lemon, you're going to get a lemon result. And that's what and that's what, that's what the key problem is for us with public sector. We must fix the leadership crisis on our continent. There is a serious leadership deficit on our continent. Let's not you know, fool ourselves about this. 
So what must begin to happen is that civil society would need to get the attention of some of the philanthropists to sort of say, how do you begin to look at leadership as a deliberate process? Where you're actually developing leaders, not just um, you know, training people to be technical. For technical problems, we can buy technical solutions. But for leadership, we can buy. That's why we're, that's why we're caught in a, in, a, in a trap on our continent. And we've got to disrupt this. Now, the second part of my talk is that people keep saying institutions as if there was some fear by which you get to institutions. I dare to say to you that governments put in place systems and processes and agencies, but they don't become institutions. No. They only become institutions when citizens are weak and understand that lethargic citizens don't build institutions. You can wait forever. Institutions will not emerge out of the laws, out of the agencies. They will only become institutions when the pressure of demand for the performance of the basis for which they were established is placed on them by citizens. And that is why I now talk about the active office of the citizen. This time when citizens of the continent looked away, waiting for some messiah to fix the problem. It's over. You've got to rescue yourselves. and jointly accountable. Now, um, we work on the assumption that every segment understands what they're supposed to do. It's not true. Um, there is no government that fully understands its responsibilities. Mrs. Ezekiel we went on a one-man match. One-woman match. I can't <laughs> <my God. laughs> And did she have an impact? Absolutely. Yeah. So, what am I saying? All of us have to think of how to create various spaces of sanity. Mm -hmm. uh, the institution I work for, which is access, is determined to ensure that in its own way, it creates its own spaces of sanity. Now, the time that you keep talking about, oh, let's wait for the appropriate leadership, what is this? No, we have to get into the doing, all right? I'm tired of thinking and looking back and saying, let us wait, things are going to get better. No, we have to actually get into the action mode. Let's, 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 let's make it better for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Now, if the previous generation failed us, we have no reason to fail the generation that is coming behind us. And it's, and it's the truth. I mean, I, I sit between some of the most powerful women in the continent and who are saying the greatest things possible. Now, what do we really need to do to change all of this narrative? It means each and every person here has to join that whole exercise and start to show and portray Africa in a totally different light. I don't see myself just as a Nigerian. I see myself as an African, mm. as a starting point, all right? And then I just happen to come to that from Nigeria. We all are not, nobody here could have determined where he was born. Nobody, all right? We just come from this continent. Now, what do we do about making sure that the whole continent is seen as one market? How do our leaders, all right, and I'm talking about both private and public sector, ensure that they are interconnected? It is only then that we can create a strong, truly strong Africa. All right, that is standing, you know, pair, you know, you know, side by side with other global uh, uh, markets. Now, but the good news though is that things are changing for the better, and we have to comply. Now, some of those stereotypes around 
bribery, corruption, as if it were just from Africa. Those words are English words after all. If you get to the point of <laughs> I mean, they, 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 they've existed everywhere in the world. But the world is craving for a new uh, uh, type of life, uh, new values, etc., etc. And I think what is important is for us, together, jointly, together with our leadership, to say, we're not going to be left behind. All right? Each time, all right, we don't rise up to the occasion, what happens is that Africa gets left behind. And what does it mean? Great private sector leaders, uh, whether they can go to the world, people, you know, doing different things would never, never emanate. So we have to do great things and we have to get into action, the real actionable mode, whether in civil society or in private sector or in public sector, to solve it. It gets important, like you mentioned, Rwanda has done something great. Absolutely. Whether you like to believe it or not, I mean, I don't care what people think about the leadership there. It is a great, yeah, it's a great so, something has happened. All right. We are also beginning to see certain things in other countries, all right, in West Africa, perhaps not at the same scale. And until civil society leaders also rise up and tell government, this is our expectation. Citizens stand up at the national say, this is what we want to do. If we get further better, way, then only, all right, we will be able to have and get the momentum to be desired. So we, we need to go back to the drawing table and the definition of what the CEO's role is. Yes. It's not just the typical traditional private sector CEO role. Maybe we need to write a job description all over again. Absolutely. For the role of the CEO. Absolutely. Right? So Absolutely. Thank, you. thank you for that. We all have a role to play, it's what we're here. Now, the big question, the big question, here comes the big question. Corruption question, right? The corruption question. That's I'd like to start. I'd like to start. Like to start because Obi already blamed the private sector. <laughs> <laughs> I would just start to blame. No, no, she said, she said that just as bad. <laughs> so, please start. Help us to understand how do we tackle this challenge? I think. I think. In this image. I think first of all, it takes two to tangle. Uh, uh, you couldn't have called somebody from the public sector corrupt without it, it's got to part of the private sector. Mm -hmm. So everybody's complicit. Now, civil society is indeed playing a strong role, all right, because they're an independent party in putting pressure and ensuring that that ends. Now, several other institutions, like the Mo Ibrahim Governance Index, all right, which is rating countries, all right, um, along the lines of good governance, corruption, ease of doing business, etc and creating a transparent index all right, for people to see and hold their government responsible is also a strong thing. All right? But I think as citizens, it's also important that we all rise to it. All right? And when we have those issues, we have to tackle it you know, head on. All right? And once that happens, more and more and more, I think um, it's not gonna be, we're going to see that whole issue drop. But what is, what is responsible for corruption? I mean, you also have to double click and ask yourself, what is the problem? And across the continent, all right, it's because of the failure of institutions. And I don't want to um, go back into the definition, which is obvious that it's spoke to, but it's about this, the failure of institutions. If civil servants cannot pay their children's school fees, what do you think will happen? If they cannot pay the hospital bills of their children, will they sit down and see their children die? All right? So we have to ask ourselves, are those basic things required to ensure that there's adequate, the adequacy in terms of lifestyle and standard of living for these people? Okay. If you don't provide it, it is just a natural human tendency for it to happen. So, our governments have to think of how do you lift the citizenry out of poverty? And it's not just government, all right? The private sector has to ask itself as well, what are we doing in that respect? Yes, what are we doing in that respect? Now you make money. What are you doing with respect to the underserved? All right, I come from a country where 60% or 65% of, of our population is under 35. All right, and there's a large number of children who are unemployed. What will happen to the future of those children if you get a part of that? So until we all start understanding, all right, and providing for that generation, all right, it's really difficult to solve that problem. But that solution can only start from today. Yes. Yeah. And I think, again, of all these, discuss, all these um, opinions and views, I think we all have a part to play as individuals. We all have a part to play. But I know that the, the, the audience is itching to ask questions. We can, this, is, this has been on the main panel. But let me, let me go to the audience uh, and take some questions.
goes to anyone on the panel who cares to answer. Um, we have seen recently that, as um, the CEO of Access Bank has said, the African continent is very young. And as a result, we've seen a lot of the new face of leadership be young people. So we've seen this in Ethiopia. I lived in Tunisia for five years, lived through the Arab Spring that was raised by young people. We're seeing it in Gambia and so many other countries. So if you had an opportunity to tell the youth, particularly those that are interested in politics or entering politics, any advice, what would be the one thing that you would advise them um, in order to realize some of the um, points that you've raised during the conversation? I would say, take tomorrow, your future is truly in your hands. Um, I think even though it is largely government's responsibility to provide uh, the appropriate and enabling environment for people to thrive, um, I think young people and the use of social media these days, um, which has, by the way, its own deficiencies, all right, can put pressure on everybody all right, to ensure that the youth are adequately supported. Because actually, they truly represent the future of our continent. Now, most of the conversation that has happened today has had to do with the creation of institutions, the determination of our future, accountability, etc., etc. If you have a young, timid population, they can determine the future of that country. They can determine what happens at elections. If you get the point of president. And that is why you see the nature of people who are coming out now as the new leaders. They are young, vibrant, etc. I mean, and it's not just in Africa, you know, across the world, we beginning to happen. So I think they should just take a few from it. Let them be much more interested, all right, in the politics. Let them be more interested um, in, 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 in um, all the things around uh, civil advocacy, etc. And their voices will be heard. Nobody can stop them anymore. Uh, in the past, you needed to reach out to newspapers. This day, just put that people, you know, the whole world will be screaming. Now, it has its, uh, it has its issues, but quite frankly, uh, on the balance, all right, you do have a voice, a stronger voice. It's your voice. It's your voice. So, um, my biggest, or my, my huge apology is to anyone from uh, Zimbabwe in the world. Um, so you have to forgive me already. Before I say what I'm about to say. <laughs> I, when, when this conversation about the young politician and the old politician, when it comes up, I normally say to people to be careful of the danger of a single story, like my um, my patriot, uh, my compatriot Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie said. Um, I say to them to be mindful of it because. We also have young Mugabe's. It also it's, it's a spirit of the, the, the wrong kind of the values of leadership. We knew, we were growing up, we knew Bob Mugabe, President of Bob Mugabe. He was a hero for all of us as one who championed the fight for his country. And see what went wrong. Now, when it went wrong, there were young people around us. They would have imbibed some of that spirit of that kind of leadership. If we replace old people with that spirit of leadership, we haven't made any difference, have we? So, so we, we need to be very mindful that it is not the matter of the age, it is the age of the idea that should matter to us. It is not the age of the individual. It's the age of the idea that backs up the leadership nuances, leadership values, leadership style, leadership vision. And we are missing that when we do the conversation as purely a conversation of young and old. And then the second thing is that for a young person to begin to think of leadership on the continent now, they would need to think of it from a differentiation perspective, right? They need to sort of say that the leadership of their parents um, had, had, didn't deliver much for the continent. 
but this is the best opportunity that the continent has to claim the 21st century. So we cannot have incremental leaders. We must have disruptive leaders from amongst the young people. So these are going to be the kinds of leaders that are basically saying disruptive technology can disrupt every kind of stagnation that we found ourselves in and just jump us up to a totally different dimension of development outcomes. So we need the leaders, the leaders of the of, of, of the internet of things, the leaders of the uh, the age of the artificial intelligence, the robotics, uh, the uh, blockchain technologies. We want to see leaders who are conversant with everything that has to do with machine learning. We want leaders that are people of simulation science. Data, big data. We want leaders that just completely, just simply say, Africa can claim the 21st century. Yeah. 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 If I may add something, it's um, one word it's service. 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 Leadership. Service. Yeah. Leadership to serve and not leadership to sell servant leadership. Servant yeah. English is not my wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's one of the, the, the issues and the uh, put it right. It's not an issue of age or not age. Although the, although you must say if our nations have such youthful I mean the uh, uh, populations, young people want to see themselves in the leadership as well. So there needs to be a balance in terms of having some young people who take up high positions in politics, high positions as we have in business, etc. So that people will, young people will identify themselves with the kind of thinking and the energy which comes from uh, being young. When you have our parliament, I'm sorry to say, most of our parliament members of parliament they are over 50, 60, 70, sometimes they sleep in the meeting. <laughs> no, 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 we have seen this because they are tired. So it's a, no, 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 that, that is true. And so we need also to look at this and say, you have a useful population, you need to also to encourage and create an empty space for young people to take up I mean, high positions yeah. in all levels. It's a, it's in government, it's in judi judiciary, it's in business, in universities, etc., etc. So that's my point. But what I wanted to add to what has been said is that leadership is about service. To you. It's leadership. It's not only for you to be brilliant on your own, and leadership is not also to resolve problems of your group yeah. and then yeah. oh it's your ethnic group it's a, leadership is to take into account really the profound aspirations of your people in totality not only some people and you say how do you then talk about the transform exactly so the, we lack also many examples of people who are connected to serve the people and so when you ask my daughter, they said, what would you Number. advise? Part of our advice is exactly leadership is about service. It's not about self-service. So we decide that we will have everyone who becomes a leader of our continent. If we said that they must have character, they must have competence, and they must have capacity, we have captured the whole of, of, of what makes for a really sound and quality leader. I hope you will keep joining me in saying that, that we no longer want locals as leaders. The locals is someone who is in leadership to serve themselves. They are transactional leaders. We no longer want uh, dollars in leadership. Yeah. They haven't given any time mm -hmm. to get in some expertise or knowledge around everything. We also don't want leaders that are lazy. They are really slothful leaders. And, and when a leader is slothful, the country will be slothful. That's the truth. So, so we need character, we need competence, and we need capacity. Yeah, I would also I like think, to add one thing. I already done with that. I didn't need to. I didn't need to.
I'm going to bring down this mandate. Uh, this uh, notion of service, I fully agree. We also have to institute hope. I think this is something that was missing when there was the Arab Revolution. There was this feeling that there was no longer any hope. But I think here, again, bringing down to the digital down to earth, is that government has a role to play in providing the enabling environment for this to happen, to nurture that notion of service and also to create that notion that hope is not lost. Mm -hmm. And this is where government has a role to play. Unfortunately, we have to come back again to government because they have a key role to play to see to it that these precise young people become entrepreneurs. They become social entrepreneurs, they become social entrepreneurs, they become job creators and not job seekers. And this is something that we have to instill in the youth because the statistics of the World Bank are horrible. 11 to 15 million youth reach the job market in Africa every year, and there's no way in hell any government can create that many jobs. So the notion that we have to give to the youth is that there is hope, but you have to learn to take your best in Just one final question. I know that you can carry that. We have just one more question. Kennedy, I'm with the Hala Foundation. Um, just want to ask, there's this uh, story on leadership, and uh, I think there are various definitions of, uh, of leadership. And when you listen to the panel, you, know, you can tell that each of the panelists is looking at leadership from a different angle. I just want to ask, at what point will Africa become very deliberate in actually building that leader we're talking about. I'm talking of when will our governments and the philanthropists and civil society actually design leaders deliberately, you know, to say in Zimbabwe, for example, we should have by 2020 100 leaders who will be able to go into these different sectors so that we actually see a deliberate growth of leaders that will go and transform um, you know, our nations. And I would like to believe that that will take us into the transformation of the continent. Thank you. It's a good question. Um, maybe I should just share my views. It happened in the 60s, for instance, in my country. Um, and basically, the politicians at a particular point in time, um, most of them, not on us, determined uh, who was going to go into politics, who was going to go into academia, etc., etc., etc. But all that was abused over time. And I think it comes down to some of the points which Professor Christie has raised, and I can see Mrs. Marshall has spoken about. It has to be a deliberate effort. Otherwise, the foundation will be back in. Let me just put it very sharply, associated to you. Until we can lift up people from poverty, the fundamentals of democracy will be threatened because if I put a meal on your table for you to vote for me, you will not vote for me. Yeah, so you will not be thinking of just the best. You will not be thinking of whether I'm a slut. You will not be thinking of anything. You will vote for me. It's, in Nigeria, they say it's the democracy, infrastructure was too bad. If you get the point I'm saying. So it takes away all the reason from everybody. So what we need to do is to again put pressure on existing governments and bring them to their senses as to what their primary responsibility is, which is a big calling, as our excellency mentioned. The, 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 the requirement that you are supposed to serve people, all right, and not to self-serve. And once you do that, all right, it means you are lifting up literacy levels, it means that you're helping people come out of poverty, then only can they begin to think, let us get the right leader. Let's get that destructive leader. So, and then corporate people pay the tax. And as well. As <laughs> can, I, can I be practical and say to you that are gathered here that you could actually make, you could actually decide that you're going to embark on a project on building the kind of academies that deliberately, intentionally, strategically produce a leadership pipeline. I, I correctly. One of the things that I'm working on under the program, the program that I run, basically advises presidents and their cabinets on how to really just articulate sound economic policies 
and human development policies as well as execute them. In addition to that, we're working on establishing a, an Africa Academy to train policy people who go into government and can do really good work. So I think that this organization, this forum, you can decide on the project of that kind. Africa is vast. The pipeline that we need is huge. You can work on that and achieve that. I think we need to, what you're saying is we need to take the tour of the likes of um, African Leadership Academy, African Leadership University, the Fred Swanika story. We need a lot of that uh, as well. So that being said, what an amazing discussion, but I have one final in closing from each of you. If you can just share in a sentence, share with me what would you like your legacy to look like? Or what would your legacy, what are you looking to be like? And then, in a tweet from each of you, in a tweet as we go along, um, from Herbert, what is the tweet that you would tweet to the private sector leadership? You've made some very powerful points. This is Michelle, a tweet of advice to African philanthropists. Your Excellency, a tweet to governments and the public sector. Only a tweet to policy makers. So two sentences. One is your legacy and one is the advice, the tweet that we're going to send out to the stakeholders. Start from that. I, <laughs> I definitely have not been worried about legacy, about my legacy. I'm very honest about it. I've been simply doing things which I believe are important to do and I feel passionate to do. And what is going to be the legacy is the business of those who are going to judge how positive or not positive it is. So I'm, I'm not really able to answer that question. Yeah. But the, the, the Twitter is so what? To philanthropists. To philanthropists. To the people Philan who took yes. Philanthropists. Yeah. African philanthropists. What advice if we have to send a tweet to African philanthropists? Most of which people are starting here today. Be deliberate in transforming communities in which you work. Transform, not only providing services, to transform those communities. Thank you. Uh, for the youth, uh, I would say that uh, your success will be my legacy. And uh, the one that in terms of, uh, because we have talked about that corruption in the private public sector, every corrupt action makes the country weaker. Fantastic. Fantastic. Very powerful. Thank you. Thank you. I do have a legacy I have. I don't have a legacy for like her excellency. She doesn't need to have a legacy because she speaks for herself already. <laughs> um, I want to be seen and known as one who has, with a team, created a strong, formidable platform that has helped several millions of Africans come out of poverty. Mm. <laughs> I think our young population in Africa is our strength. The private sector must use its strong convening power to ensure intergenerational collaboration because only then can we unleash the true power yeah, of that young population in Africa. Fantastic. 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 I would like to be remembered as the woman who refused to negotiate her values. But through that discussion, we've also learned that there's more work to be done amongst all of us. 
whether it's the public sector, whether it's the private sector, or whether it's philanthropist, all of us, there's work for us to do, and we've learned a lot from this discussion. So, on behalf of the FDA, thank you so very much. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I want to hear the applause of the Parliament side to chat. Pay the heat coming from this panel. Another rousing round of applause.